Good morning. I am Tammy Hepps, and I have the pleasure of introducing one of my favorite people in all of genealogy. I will try not to go off script, uh, but I need my tiptoes because she's much taller than I am. <laughs> Brooke Schreier Gans is the founder of Reclaim the Records, a not for profit activist group that uses state freedom of information requests to return genealogical records to the public. As the former vice president of Gesher Galizia, she designed and built their website, including its innovative All Galizia database. The underlying search engine code base, named LeafSeq, was released by Brooke as a free open source project, for which she won second place in the 2012 Roots Tech Developer Challenge. She further refined it to build the bilingual All Israel database for the Israel Genealogical Research Association, or IGRA. She lives in California. And all of you are making a great cho choice hearing this talk. It's going to be amazing and one of the most exciting talks for all of the conference. And I'm not biased at all. <laughs> Enjoy. <clears throat> Thank you, Tammy. So, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. My name is Brooke Gans, and you're in the Reclaim the Records talk. Uh, you are feel free. Please feel free to take photos of my slides or tweet this. I am very open about posting my slide decks online. This will be posted to our website after the conference. Um, hi, if you don't know me, I am Brooke Gans. I've been involved in Jewish genealogy for many years. Um, I have various achievements you can read about here. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about today is something called Reclaim the Records. And it is about how you can use freedom of information laws to get the records that you want for your family's history. Records that you might have been told are not available or sorry, you can only come on site to see these. Because freedom of information laws are awesome for genealogy. You can get all kinds of records that you thought were just not available to you. Birth indexes, marriage indexes, passport records, tax lists, and so much more. And I'm gonna show you just a couple examples in case you don't believe me. These are just some random examples of records that have been gotten by freedom of information requests, whether federal FOIA or state freedom of information laws. This is um, a member of our group's uh, grandfather's passport record, uh, his high school record, educational records are often available, um, voter registration records, Roster cards if your family worked in the civil service for a city or state government. And of course, some of the things I've gotten, marriage indexes for entire cities. Sometimes they're on microfilm, sometimes they're on you know hard drives that they send to you in the mail. By the way, they sent this letter just that crinkled. I think it was passive aggressive, it came that way. <laughs> so let me explain who we are. We are Reclaim the Records. And this is something that started as my personal passion project and has now grown into an actual real life nonprofit organization. Um, we have registered with the IRS. We are a 501c3 and we are about to start taking donations. Reclaim the Records aim is to tell all of you, all genealogists, that you can use these records. You can use freedom of information laws to get access to things. We've been incredibly successful and you can do it too. And you can use these to get any kind of record set with some limitations, which we'll discuss. You can, we want to crowdsource ideas from the public about what records do you know about that we don't know about yet that we need to focus on getting out to the larger public. We want to do everything transparently. So we publish our freedom of information requests in real time, and we publish the responses we get from the city and state governments in real time to show that this is an open process, that it's all happening out in the open. It's not secret backroom dealing to get records. Um, and we want to be an educational and advice portal and a voice for change in records access because so much of what we do as genealogists depends on having records available. And what do you do if that core foundational building block of your research is not available to you? Well, I'll tell you some of the things we did. You have many ways of getting involved with us. I hope you'll use at least some of these. We have an email newsletter, totally free. Um, we publish about once a month, once every six weeks. We have a Facebook page. You can like us. We're a little more active there. And we have a snarky Twitter feed. So if you like Twitter, you can read us. And we're just constantly making fun of government agencies. Choose your preference. Our goal as an organization is to put it online for free for everyone. Put it online means records. We want records of all shapes and sizes. We want data. We want things that no one else ever had before. And we want to put it online for free, meaning not only free to use, but also free like a, a explicitly public domain. No paywalls, no logins required. Just out there, public records for the public, for everyone. That is our goal. We are not trying to build a brand new portal where you come pay us money. We believe these records belong to all of us. We want them returned to all of us. We have had incredible success. We've had more than 10 million genealogical records already online from our work in the past two and a half years since this started. Thank you. 
Like I said, we, we don't put any usage restrictions or copyrights or paywalls. This is your data, and we want to bring it back to you. And if you want to help us, please email us, info at reclaimtherecords.org. So what we're going to talk about today is what are the freedom of information laws? How do you use them for genealogy? How did we use them for genealogy? And what are some of the crazy things that happened to us along the way? And some really crazy things happened. And then a little more about Reclaim the Records and our goal for the next few years. So let's just recap how this started. This started as a personal project in 2015, and I'll explain why I started this crazy crusade. We got the New York City Marriage License Index, about 3 million records, roughly. Then in 2016, we went to a different New York City agency for the completion of the New York City Marriage License Index, about 5 million records. We got the list of registered voters in New York City, about 800,000 records. We got a bunch of uh, vital records indices out of the New Jersey State Archives in Trenton, about 450,000 records. We got the death index this year so far, uh, maybe 8 million records. We don't know because they never had a database of it before. They only had microfiche till we came along. We have a lawsuit in progress, our third one. We're suing Missouri right now, the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. We filed the day before Thanksgiving. Um, it is still in progress. It is very slow going. I'll give you an update on that. We don't even know how million, many millions of records that is, just for the index, which they decided not to publish, and we decided they should publish. And upcoming very soon, we're going to have another records release, a northeastern state. I can't tell you which one yet because it's not my secret to reveal, but it is 116 years of data. So I don't know how many millions of records that is, but all it took was a little work with the freedom of information laws at the state level, and all of a sudden, look what we can do. So you can do this too. Because I want to point out to you, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> you do not need to be a lawyer to use freedom of information laws. That's the really cool part. I am not a lawyer, but my parents wish I were. I was expected to become a lawyer. My dad's a lawyer, my sister's a lawyer, but I really liked tech and I went into tech in state instead because I love building stuff. I love building stuff for genealogy. I built databases to help publish records that we already have for Gesher Galizia, for the Israel Genealogical Research Association, who they have a million records on their site with the software I built. And I'm from New York. I love New York. So this is not meant to be just about New York City or New York State, although I will be talking about those areas a lot. This is absolutely applicable to the areas that you are interested in, the types of records you're interested in, the eras, the locations. But my personal interest was New York, so New York is in this talk a lot. However, please feel free to substitute your own state there when necessary. So I love New York. Um, I grew up in New York. I, my whole family basically is from New York. They got off the boat at Ellis Island, stayed in New York, all but like a tiny sliver of my family that then eventually moved to New York. And all the records I want are in New York or New York City. But I live in California. I married a guy from California, and I've been out in California for years. And sort of like looking out back at New York City across the country, like maybe this is the year they're going to put something online. Maybe this is the year they're going to give records access to one of the other nonprofit or for-profit genealogical organizations. Maybe they'll publish something. And you know what? The years went by and it never happened. New York City research, if, for those of you who know, is a black hole. And New York State to a large extent too, but New York City is particularly bad about it. And as the years got by, went by, I got more and more frustrated that anything I wanted to research was locked up or you could only see it on site. Either you had to physically be in the building or you wouldn't have access at all. And I decided to change that. So every state has different laws about what can go online. Every state and city has their own ideas about what should go online, what's feasible to put online, and New York was not getting there. And I got really frustrated. So I love New York, but I sued them twice in the past three years. Let me tell you about that. I decided that I decided that open data laws, the laws to put records online, were not getting me what I wanted. And just having people beg them was not getting me what I wanted. But freedom of information laws could finally be the hack, the ax that knocks down the tree. It's, the, it's the, the hammer that smashes the wall. So you start out from just being incredibly frustrated as a genealogist. But you have to start thinking and moving away from frustration to identifying what is out there finding the legal justification to get those records, acquiring them using freedom of information laws, copying them into better formats, because who wants to sit there with a microfilm reader, putting them online so they're free and very accessible and you can do research in your pajamas, which is all of our, our goal. <laughs> and then if you have some extra records at your house, donate them to the proper location so that there's still another repository. And then teach everybody else how you can do it too. That's what I'm doing today. 
So some of this I'm going to go through now fairly quickly is the ex examples of what you can and cannot FOIA and FOIL, what are the differences in these laws, and then we'll get to some of the fun part, which is how I use the laws. But just to get to the dry stuff first, when you want to get some records under the Freedom of Information Law or Freedom of Information Act or your state's Freedom of Information statewide law, you have to find out, is this record actually withheld for some reason? Is there some overriding reading that explicitly says this type of record is not allowed? Or do they just not mention your type of record? Or do they explicitly say they are allowed? Um, is there some other law that says, maybe the vital records law, which you also have to look at, that says that a certain type of record might be restricted? You have to just do a lot of research. And again, I am not an attorney, but I have Google, and I have a lot of persistence, and I have people who have helped me along the way, and you can too. So let's discuss FOIA and FOIA with the L. FOIA, F-O-I-A, is the Freedom of Information Act. That is the famous one. That has been around for a long time. It is for federal agencies. I have not actually used FOIA yet. I'm going to be for federal record sets, but I have not used that one yet, even though it's more famous. We actually all use FOIA all the time, and we kind of don't realize we're doing it. When you go to the Social Security Administration's website and you want to order somebody's SS5, which I recommend you do, you are technically filing a FOIA. If you look at the title of that page, it says Electronic Freedom of Information Act. The SS5, just to clarify for those of you who don't know, everybody who applied for a social security number had to fill out a piece of paper in their handwriting saying, I'm applying for my first ever number, here's my mother's name and mother's maiden name, here's my father's name, date of birth, they're a great resource. And you can get those under FOIA. Some naturalization papers you get are technically being done under FOIA through the USCIS genealogy portal. And some passport records you may have gotten for records uh, for genealogy research are also technically using FOIA. So it's kind of there on the back end, but it's not as explicit. What I've been using are the state level laws. There are also state level freedom of information laws. And in New York, it's called FOIA, -L, freedom of information L with an L at the end. Every state has a different state level law. You have to look up your state. They all have different names. Um, Utah has the best name. Their, their state law is called GRAMA, G-R-A-M-A. <laughs> which I would love to use grandma someday to get grandma's records. <laughs> so there's 51 different freedom of information laws. And one of, the one of the best ways to look up, okay, what is the name of the law in the state that I'm interested in, is a website called Ballotpedia. And Ballotpedia is sort of like Wikipedia, but for democracy, they concentrate on electoral issues and state ballot initiatives and things like that. So you can just click through to any one of these state or DC pages and it will uh, take you to more information about your particular state's law. You do not have to live in these states to use that state law. I live in California, I use New York's law. There is a very small number of exceptions to that. Virginia is one of them. If you want Virginia records, you either have to be a Virginia in-state resident or you find a Virginia proxy filer for you who will just file your records for you. So basically you can get anything. You don't really need to worry where you live. Another great source is the, uh, the National Freedom of Information Coalition, which also has lots of information on state laws. Making these requests are free. I can't stress this enough. So much in genealogy is expensive or involves breaking out your credit card. Making a request of a government agency is free. If you need to appeal it, the appeal is free. If you need to go to mediation, some states have mediation, also free for you if you need to go to court because they're absolutely not listening to you. And unfortunately, this happened to me a bunch of times now. That's where it can attend, potentially get expensive. But you might win your attorney's fees, which happened to me once. You could win your records and not win attorney's fees, which also happened to me once. It depends on your state law. Some states require that, well, if you won the records, clearly you were in the right, therefore you definitely get your attorney's fees. A lot of states don't have that yet, and it's at the discretion of the judge. Now, most of the time, you won't ever need to go to, to a court or anything like that. You can just solve it by making the request, and they're very nice to listen to you and to respond. So, and if they don't, please come talk to me, and we'll help you. When you send a records request, you're sending it to an agency. You don't send it to a specific guy. You send it to the, the, the person who is in that role at the agency you want. 
when I wanted the New York City marriage license index from the New York City Municipal Archives, I sent it to their FOIL officer. When I wanted something from the city clerk's office, I sent it to their FOIL officer. You can often find this on their webpage. If you go to the Contact Us page on most city or state websites, it'll say for FOIL requests or for you know California public records requests or whatever your state law is, click here to send one or here is their dedicated email address. And everyone should have a FOIL officer listed. Who can you not send a request to? This is important. In some states, there are restrictions on what counts as something that's under this law and what isn't. In New York State, which includes New York City, you cannot use FOIL to get records from the judiciary. It just happens in that state to be closed um, under that law. There are other ways to get records out of the New York judiciary. You can use Judicial Law 255, but not the Freedom of Information Law. Um, so just think about workarounds if it's not working for you. Here's the cool part. If you win records under the freedom of information laws, you only pay the actual cost of getting the records. You don't have to worry about markup or subscriptions. You pay what it costs them to copy. Most of these laws explicitly say, okay, it's 10 cents a page for a copy, or maybe it says 25 cents a page. Usually it's 10 cents. They may also have, if they're a newer law, they might say, or you can request a scan, and the scan is capped at, say, 25 cents. When I won microfilms from New York City, I won them for the actual cost of a duplication of a microfilm, which is $37 per film. Now, I did have to pay shipping, $50 shipping insured, California, that's fine. And they were allowed to charge me a little bit for the labor. You're not getting something for free from the government. You're, they're allowed to reimburse their labor costs, but they can only charge you at the rate of the lowest paid person on staff who's capable of doing that work. New York City never charged me for labor, and I didn't tell them they could have. So. And here's the other thing, you get what they have. You cannot make a government agency make a brand new record set for you. You cannot tell them, please transcribe these millions of records and send me the nice transcribed spreadsheet. Unfortunately, no, they'll send you what they have. So when I got microfilms, it's because that's all they had. Um, you get what they have. Like I said, sometimes if it's paper, you can request either paper copy or scan of the paper copy for a little more money. But you get what there is. You're not getting a new work product, you're getting the existing government work product. Okay, so how do you do this? You find out the parent agency, you find out who your contact person is, you decide who has the thing that I want. It might be Department of Health, we're dealing with genealogical records here mostly. Um, it might be your city clerk, it might be your county clerk. Sometimes there's a second copy kept at the local level before they sent everything over to the Department of Health. You have to check how is it done in the state you're interested in. Um, if you're looking for educational records or any kind of record st uh, stored in a state archive, that actually might be under Department of Education as the parent agency. City clerk's offices are tricky because, again, they sometimes fulfill judicial functions, and in some states you can't get judicial records. But if they had, for example, a city public cemetery where the city's public records of who was buried in that city cemetery happen to be held by the city clerk or the county clerk, that is not really judicial, and that may be available under a city or a state uh, freedom of information request. What can you not ask for? Anything that is way too personal, crime victim information, um, social security numbers. In some states, though, it varies. For example, in New York, you can get educational records, but in Maryland, you can't. But in Maryland, you can get judicial records, which means you can get naturalizations. But New York, you can't. So you have to look at what's available. And again, those websites I mentioned, Ballotpedia, will really help you understand the nuances. And I'm happy to be a resource, too. If you have any questions, I'll help you do the research. Can you FOIL just a certificate? Because we all want certificates. They're the bread and butter of our work. No. And here's why. In the law, they are allowed to be the person who gives out certificates. They can set strict rules on who can access it. You know, are you a next of kin? How many years is the close? And how much do I charge for it? And they charge a lot. So it's not the 10 cents per copy. It's like $22. They're allowed to do all this. I don't love it, but that's what it is. However, can you FOIL the index to those records? Yes, because the states generally forgot to mention in their laws that the index might be restricted or not. The only state I know of that actually remembered to put the word index in their restrictions, as far as I know, is Pennsylvania. So they, they had made work product. They figured out a way to have a finding aid to their certificates or to their other type of certificate, to an index in naturalizations, an index to educational records. They made it on government time, on government property. You can probably get a copy of that, and you, we've gotten millions. 
And they generally never said that there was a time limit on an index unless they were really good about remembering that, or really bad, as you might feel. <laughs> Some of them charge you for access to the index or access to a search. That might actually be illegal. We haven't charged, we haven't fought that fight yet. We're trying to go for the low-hanging fruits. Can you FOIL another type of records index? Maybe. Can you FOIL to get an informational copy of a certificate? If the certificate is out of deadline, it's, if it's, say, more than a 50-year-old death certificate, so it's, it's technically open to everybody if you pay $22 for the search or whatever. Maybe. We haven't done this yet, but it's something I would like to do in the future. For example, there are many states where after 50 years, all records, all death records are available, but you're still paying for the certificate, and the certificate they're allowed to charge you because it's a legal document. But it was on microfilm before they printed it. What if I FOIL a copy of the microfilm? I don't want a certificate. Certificate implies paper, implies a raised seal. I want the document they have, which is the microfilm. What if I get a copy of their microfilm, and I know it's just informational? I haven't tried this yet. Someday, maybe. Okay, I'm gonna go a little faster through some of this nitty gritty to get to the fun, how did the government try to mess with us stories. Once you know the parent agency, you find their FOIL officer, and how do you send this request? You can send it all through email, which is great, that's what I do. Um, you can also send it through postal mail, or you could send it through Muckrock, which I send it through email through Muckrock, muckrock.com, which is like muckrake, but muckrock, haha. It's a free nonprofit website that helps you learn about freedom of information requests, both federal and state. You can see up in the top right corner, there's a blue button, create a FOIA request. Well, even if you don't submit through this website, you can just read through everybody else's requests. There are hundreds of thousands of them on here. Um, and you type in what you want, where it's going to, is it state, local, federal? Um, and it will have the addresses and contact information that they know of for every agency. So you don't need to look it up. They'll fill it in with their drop down. And they send out their request using their return address. So you get a little bit of privacy. And anytime they get a response, they post it to your page. So for example, I, this is a list of ones I submitted a while ago. It tells me what state they're in. Are they a draft request I sent out? Am I waiting on a response? Did I already get the response, but I need to respond now? And so on. It's, it's a useful site. You don't have to use it, but I do recommend it. So here's the secret sauce of what you write in your FOIL request. Hi, my name is Brooke Schreier Gans, and I am making a request under cite the name of the state law. If you're using Muckrock, it fills in that line for you because it knows where you're sending it to. I am seeking. Tell them what you want. Um, don't make it super long. Don't tell them your life story. Make it a very clear description of the records that you want that you already know they have, um, or you really have reason to believe they have. Um, I always like to say, make a start date and an end date to make it as specific as possible. Give them as few chances as possible to mess up your request. You might need to add the line in some states, I am a private individual, not a for-profit company, and these records will go online for free. Fine, just stick that line in there. Very small number of states like Virginia, I am a resident of the state, but rarely does that happen. I would prefer the format to be, stick in your preferred format. You might have to get only what they have, but maybe you have a choice between scans or copies, et cetera. I'm willing to pay up to, stick some random number in there just to say up to this amount, I'm willing to pay. You are making an offer to pay. That's part of the law in some states. And if there's any question about this, contact me first. And thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from you in the three days or five days or seven days, whatever your law says as required by law. Thank you, hit send they're supposed to get back to you in a certain number of business days. They rarely do it on time. They may say, we got your record, we got your request, we're going to get back to you in two more weeks. Give them a little time. They're all overwhelmed. I know they're breaking the law, but just give them a little time. If you need help to learn more about what is available under the law or not available under the law in your state, there are great organizations out there. And I was so lucky in New York, there's a group called the Committee on Open Government, C-O-O-G, COOG. And they're a group in Albany funded by the legislature, They're funded, and they just get funding every year to sit in a room and answer questions from the public about freedom of information law requests in New York. So you can call them up or email them and be like, hi, I'm a genealogist trying to get marriage license records. I've never done this before. Do you think this sounds okay? And they're like, yeah, this sounds okay. And they go through the steps with you and they say, okay, I think this should be available. 
And if you request, they will write you an advisory opinion. An advisory opinion is not legally binding, but it's coming from a state expert, a known state expert. Um, Committee on Open Government is headed by Robert Freeman, who is amazing and very nice. And you can use that letter to show the organization you're talking to, the agency, like, look, the state guy thinks you're wrong and I'm right. Um, of course, I tried that and they didn't listen anyway, so I took them to court. <laughs> but they post previous records requests that other people have made, so you can learn from other people's questions. And they alphabetize them, so you can go by subject matter. And they even break this down by marriage records versus matrimonial records, which I guess is a distinction in New York. So like I said, there's 51 different freedom of information laws and a lot of 50 states plus DC. And a lot of these are very similar from state to state. If you learn one state really well, you might be able to apply it to other states to see where they differ. But here's the thing, there's 51 of these laws, but there's 57 vital records jurisdictions. It's really weird. New York City is treated like a state when it comes to vital records. They're still subject to one New York freedom of information law, but within New York for vital records, New York City is like a state. And then there's New York State, which is everything other than New York City. So I thought if I learn one law, the Freedom of Information Law, it's covering two state-like areas, the city and the state. So if I learn this, and all my family's from New York or Westchester County, which is the state, then I can get a lot of records by learning one law really well. So that's what I did. I started making lists of who has what I want. So this is kind of what I came up with for New York State. And you can make a list like this for your state. Okay, birth, marriage, death, New York State Department of Health. That's pretty standard. Town clerks have old records. They might have second copies of things. They have some interesting other files. You'd sort of have to go town by town. New York State Archives is technically underneath Department of Education. They have copies of things too. <coughs> Excuse me. And in New York, I unfortunately cannot use the judicial system in New York because that law doesn't cover it in New York. Other states, you might have more luck. I also make a list of this for New York City, and it's a little different. New York City, birth and death is with Department of Health, but the marriage records are still with the New York City clerk. That's where you go to get married. You go to the city clerk's office. That's where I went to get married in 2003. Department of Records and Municipal Archives is all the really cool old stuff, the 31 Chamber Street. So that's there. And then there's the court system. Again, I'm kind of out of luck. <coughs> So again, I think, okay, I want to make this work. I want to start using these laws to get records out of these agencies, and I need to start with the, what I thought was the easiest thing possible. So I will go for the old stuff, the old genealogically useful, no privacy restriction stuff, which means municipal archives, which is below Department of Records, which is that what I'm going to choose. I want new records. I don't want to go after stuff that's on Ancestry or Family Search or Find My Past or My Heritage. I don't want to duplicate work. I want to get stuff that we've been trying to get and we can't get. And I want to make sure I start with years that are so old they can't shut me down on a stupid privacy reason. I want to get stuff that is available and will really help us and I want to build on my wins because as much as this is about, I want my family records, I also want there to be a change in how we deal with records in this community. And I knew that if I started winning small, I could win bigger later. So yeah, pick the low-hanging fruit first and build on your wins. So January 2015 rolls around, and after years of frustration, I post my New Year's resolution to Tracing the Tribe, which is a fabulous Facebook Jewish genealogy group I recommend you all join. New Year's resolution, no more Mr. Nice Guy, no more humbly beseeching governmental entities that hold genealogical records for access to our own data. Today, I filed my first FOIL request with the city of New York. And that was the start of this as a legal thing, which was a little scary, but that should tell you how frustrating it was to deal with them. So why did I pick New York City Department of Records and what was I asking for in my very first request? Okay, there's two types of marriage records in New York City, which again is like a state unto itself. There is the one everybody knows about, which is the health department certificates. The indexes to these certificates have been online for a long time. They were originally written on index cards by the WPA in the 30s and then microfilmed. And then two nonprofit genealogy groups typed up the microfilm records. That was the Italian genealogy group, the IGG, and the German genealogy group, the GGG, both based in New York, who are fabulous. And based on their typing it up, we now have a text searchable index of this other type of certificate, the one everyone's been using for years. And they're also now on Ancestry. 
And you can use the front end through Steve Morse's site, which is a little bit easier to use to search these records through 1937. And you get a result like this, which explains, okay, you can search the brides by the brides or the grooms by the grooms. And sometimes the two records match up correctly and sometimes they don't. And then you can order these, you can see FHL microfilm number. So you can order these, these were filmed, these are available, everything's great. Everyone thinks this is all there is for New York City marriage records, but that's not true. Here's the thing, this is what they look like. They're a two page record. This is my great grandparents, Nathan and Esther. She's written as Estelle here. Page one, little bit of information about the bride and the groom. She's from New York City. He's from Russia, Bessarabi, says Bessarabia. Here's page two, not so useful. Okay, that's their marriage record. Here's the thing. There's another set of New York City marriage records that's better. It's from 1908 to the present day. It's the license, the license, the application, and the affidavit. They go together. They were originally kept and are still kept by the city clerk's office. The older records have started to be moved over to the municipal archives building, but they were city clerk records that you were granted a license so that you could go get married, just, just like today. And they're so much better and they were never online. And I thought, that is what I want to get for my first request. Let me show you why they're better. This is the same couple, my great grandparents, Nathan and Esther. I will do close-ups in a minute. Page one of this three-page form. Page two of this three-page form. Page three of this three-page form. Way more information, three sets of handwriting. Let me show you. Okay, they show the bride's occupation. They show the couple's cities of birth, not just the country of birth, the parent countries of birth. Have either of these people ever been married before? Are you sure you're still not married to your ex-husband? Tell us about when you got us divorced. Did you serve in the papers? Are you sure you're not committing bigamy? They go on and on. Um, have, uh, oh, and the home addresses of the witnesses, which I know sounds a little bit odd, but that really helped me break a brick wall in my, in my own family tree, finding, because the witnesses are often relatives. And if you can find their, their addresses, that's another piece of data for you. So for example, my great grandma Esther was working as a bookkeeper before she got married. I didn't know that. Um, by the way, she's lying about her age here. Let's yeah, move on. <laughs> you only get as good data as they gave. I have the witnesses' addresses. These are both relatives. Now I have another data piece for them. At the bottom of, this is another couple in my family. At the bottom of their form, it started changing a little into the 30s saying, do you have any other dead uh, spouses? And they list the date of death of their previous spouse. Um, the woman on this one is my relative. She too is lying. She has two dead spouses by this point. <laughs> Later on, 37, they changed the bottom of the form again. Give us a lot of data about your divorces. If you had any, are you sure you're really divorced? And the reason that this is really cool is in New York State, divorce records are sealed for 100 years, which is extra long. But if you can find a remarriage certificate, a remarriage license of one of the two people, maybe you get information about the divorce that isn't public to us yet. So, oh, best of all, 10% more records because a lot of people got a license and then the religious organization that married them forgot to file the certificate. Or there's a tiny chance maybe they got the license and they didn't get married, runaway bride or something. Whatever it is, there's more records here. So I'm like, all right, this is great. I want those online. I want copies of all of this. Everybody should have that. How do I get copies of these records? And this is the frustration we all run into. They're not online. They're never gonna go online from their, the city's point of view, because they didn't want to make deals with anybody. They didn't want to give the copies to Family Search. They didn't want to make um, the index available. And it was just like these amazing records never existed, which is insane. So how can these only be available on site? Even if you go on site and they give out that one sheet of paper about here's an overview of what we have at the city archive, they didn't even mention these. Like, what the heck? So this is my FOIL request, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but it still works, so it can work for you too. Hi, please give me all your records on disk. That's because I kind of thought they must have a database somewhere. I was so naive. We only have stuff on microfilm. Um, we can't give you anything on disk because we don't have it ourselves on disk. We never bothered to index it. Oh, okay. So this is all going over emails, by the way, back and forth in 2015. Okay, well then I will take the index to your records. I know you have the actual three page documents too. I'll just take the index and I'm just gonna go for these old years. I'll pay you for the copies. You have to emphasize you'll pay fair costs. They said, okay. Initially on their city letterhead, they said, okay. Really? Okay, great. Well, how do I pay you? Do you take credit cards? And they didn't respond. I'm like, what is going on? And I wrote to them again, do you take credit cards? How, how can I pay you? Where's the invoice? 
Oh, did we say okay? We meant no. No, we're not giving those out. These are public records and you can come on site to see them. That's why they're public. Like, well, if they're public records, by definition, you've already said they're available if I'm on site. So they are a public record. Therefore, they're subject to the freedom of information law. Like that's, that's the definition of a public record. I'm willing to pay you fair cost. How can I pay you for my final copies? I'm like, I'm gonna appeal this. And they're like, no, um, that's very nice of you, but we're not gonna actually do anything about this. So what do you do now? They've never cited a legal reason to say no. They just said, we don't do that. Well, that's not a legal reason. And when I appealed, they were supposed to send a copy to the Committee on Open Government, those people I mentioned before. They never did that. They didn't look at my advisory opinion. I got from them on my own time to show them legally this is the right thing to do. What do you do when an agency is not going to give you records? Well, I sued them which is a scary thing to say that you're going to sue New York City. Now, technically, it's not a lawsuit because I am not a plaintiff. I was a petitioner. It was an Article 78 petition in the Supreme Court of the state of New York, which is not the Supreme Court in New York. It's just it's the misnamed in New York for some reason. I found an attorney. I can tell you more about them after this if you'd like to hear uh, good recommendations. And they were fabulous. And we filed. We filed in the Supreme Court of New York. And you can see at this point, I had to put my name on this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a really big thing to sue New York City for shark hands versus the city of New York. And that's when I created Reclaim the Records. I built the website at that point. I'm like, I need a posse and we're going to together sue New York City. Now, there was nothing there but a WordPress site I built. But the city doesn't care. They just need something on the paper. So we sued. And notice the municipal archives is not on that paper. It's their parent agency, Department of Records and Information Services, D-O-R-I-S, Doris. And they settled with us. They didn't want to hear this. They were like, okay, we're supposed to, we're supposed to see them on, in court on a Friday. I wasn't going to physically be there. I'm still in California. But on Monday, they called my attorney and they said, if we give her what she wants, will she go away? And we said, yes. And they sent me the microfilms. And they had never been outside of New York ever. And this is a brand new set made for the masters. And it was on my kitchen table. And this was very gratifying. <laughs> okay, okay, well that's part one of this whole thing, but now I have microfilms. How do I get them online for everybody so I can research them in my pajamas? Everybody will know about those three page records. Well, through somebody who was very nice, I was able to get in contact with Family Search. I didn't know them, they didn't know me, but I wrote to them and said, hi, I just want a lot of really great records. Do you guys want copies for your website? Like I wanna make these absolutely available to everybody and maybe put a copy in the Granite Mountain Vault. Uh, the Granite Mountain Vault, by the way, is this amazing preservationist um, uh, vault in near Salt Lake City that ho holds all sorts of genealogical records for safekeeping buried into the side of a mountain in case of nuclear attack. It's awesome. I would love to go there someday. And they wrote back and they said, yes, that's wonderful. We'd love a copy. And would you like us to digitize them for you for free and send you back all the records and a hard drive? And they did for free. It was wonderful. They were so generous and nice. So I shipped the box to Salt Lake City. They covered shipping. They scanned everything. They put it on a hard drive. They shipped it all back. So now all of a sudden, I've got the records. And I've got them in digital format now. First time anywhere. OK, so I need to put them somewhere. But it's a lot of data. And I don't want to pay for the server costs. Comes the Internet Archive. This is archive.org. It is not archives.com. It is not archives.gov. And it is not archives.org. Archive, singular, .org is the Internet Archive. It is an online free library. You can upload anything. It's mostly books. It is uh, old scanned materials. And they want to be a resource. They are free to upload, free to host material, free to use. You do not have to log in. There is no paywall. It's not the most perfect site for hosting genealogical materials, but it's free and it's better than nothing. And it's a holding place for then other people or organizations to download from them and put on their site if they choose to. So I uploaded and I started creating a Reclaim the Records collection at the Internet Archive. This is the subset called the New York City Marriage Index. So every one of those 48 microfilms had at least one, sometimes two of these indexes on them. I'll show you what they look like. Here, they were broken up by borough and year. Here's Manhattan, 1909. And if you zoom in, which you can do, let me go back a second. Do you see there's a little white magnifying glass in the top right corner? Um, let me see if I can, right there. Okay, it's a little hard to see when you're using the site. But when you're on the site, you zoom in, you can page through the digitized microfilms. 
And with this information, it tells you sorted by grooms on one side and brides on the facing page, sorted alphabetically by borough by year. It's really easy to use. And you find the information, okay, this is the index to that three page set. You then get all the information, it's volume number, page number, license number, and a date. And the date is usually two weeks before they got married, maybe two months before they got married. It's not usually the day of the wedding. You went a little earlier to get your license. And you don't have to go in the same borough where you actually got married. You could go get you know, your license in the Bronx and marry in Manhattan or vice versa. If you go back to the previous page, you'll see there's a lot of text here on the, uh, the left side of the page. That scrolls down a lot longer and it eventually says a section, I found a name, now what? And it tells you how to then use that information you found in this index to order the actual licenses, that three-page document, which is so amazing. By the way, the three-page document is sometimes a four-page document because sometimes there is a divorce record in there proving that somebody is really divorced. Somebody on Facebook reported to me they found a Hungarian divorce document in a New York City marriage license to prove the person was divorced in Hungary. Some people found uh, baptismal certificates. You never know what's in there. Okay, so that from soup to nuts was one case. And I should point out, I did sue for attorney's fees I did not get my attorney's fees, even though I got all the records. But attorney's fees, luckily, were not so bad that time. We had a wonderful, not pro bono, but a reduced rate, wonderful public interest law firm that loves doing this kind of work, fighting the man. So um, we used them in a second case where we did get attorney's fees. New York is one of those places where you don't know what you're going to get. But that one case, as scary and nerve-wracking as it was throughout all of 2015, broke the dam with the New York City Municipal Archives because from now on, nobody will ever be able to write to them and have the lie told to them that we, don't cover, we aren't covered by the freedom of information law. And people are doing this now. That is what I want. It is not just, oh, I got New York City records, because honestly, that's not relevant to everybody, but it means one more archive at a time is learning the law applies to them. Their records are public records. So for example, this is a screenshot I got um, a man wrote to me who I never met before, a non-Jewish researcher named Bob Borlocker, who lives uh, in the New York area. I think he's in Jersey. He researches Gravesend, old Gravesend during like pre-colonial times, like, you know, before it was part of Brooklyn like it is today. And he was looking for copies of old town records. And he discovered, you know what, I bet these were microfilmed and I bet they're stored in the municipal archives. Not that we all know what's in the municipal archives because they don't publish their own finding aid. They don't even know what they have. And they have wonderful things, but they don't have a full list, so we don't know what's there. But he realized the records he wanted were in the municipal archives too. So he wrote an email to the head of the archives saying, hi, I'm researching Gravesend from the 1600s. I think you guys have the microfilms I want. I would really like copies of these so I can put them online. By the way, I heard about Brookshire Gans winning her lawsuit against you. <laughs> and because that's out there now, he got everything. Do you understand? From now on, the records are open because they can't lie and say they're not. And this is what we're doing to agency by agency, state by state. You do one lawsuit and it's scary, but if you win, it opens everything for everyone later. Another example who also followed into this is someone you might know, Phyllis Kramer. Phyllis had the idea after hearing about this case that she wanted to go for New York City lists of registered voters. And the reason is that those are open to the public under freedom of information laws if they're old enough. Um, and she wanted to get the list of everybody registered to vote. Um, she was particularly interested in the Lower East Side but we thought we would get for everything. And we, I talked to her about this and she decided <clears throat> 1924 would be a great year. Why 1924? Well, women could vote. A lot of the big wave of Jewish immigration had already naturalized. They might show up in the voter rolls. World War I is done, the men were back home and so on. Let's foil these records because that's a thing we can do now. So we did. And we wrote to the municipal archives and said, hi, um, the New York City it has a publication called the City Record. It's a government publication. And every year, they would publish in this city newspaper a list of everyone who had been properly registered to vote in the upcoming election. Because you used to register to vote every year, not just when you moved. And a lot of the cities you're all interested in probably have old voter registration lists and books too. And so we got this under the Freedom of Information Law, but by, by, by dealing nicely, you know, just through email, not like through like a formal request type stuff. Because we can do that now. Um, and so what I found, let me go back a second. You can see these are listed by address, first they're broken down by borough, by ED, AD. Um, these are all in the Internet Archive now too, this entire list. You could probably get this list for any year in New York City. 
up into, as long as it's not too recent. So I saw my great grandfather's name on the list. I'm like, okay, let's get his actual voter registration one page when he signed up to register to vote. This was the printed list of everyone who was registered, but let me see his original registration page because you can get that through the freedom of information law. So I wrote a FOIL request to, as you can see the email up there, uh, the New York City Board of Elections. And this is November 6th, so they were really busy. It was two days before the last election. So I was not expecting a response that fast, but I got a great response. I just said, you know, this is to this. I forgot to, I said, this is under a New York State Freedom of Information law. I forgot to cite the exact law number. They didn't penalize me for it. I told them I'm willing to pay you the fair costs of a copy of this one page. They didn't charge me. They are 180, completely different. New York City Board of Elections holds all this great old stuff in their warehouses and they're subject to freedom of information laws. So about two weeks later, they sent me everything via Google Drive for free, beautiful digital photos. I don't know if I was the only one this whole year who asked for it. They sent me many of these photos, the original books of everybody registering to vote. And way down there at the bottom of this book, I found not just my great grandfather, but my great great grandfather because they lived at the same house that year. And so, okay, this is really cool. I got this record in a foil for free. And so I'm trying to dis distinguish what all the different columns mean. Irving's on the bottom, Sam's on top. Irving's born in America, Sam was an immigrant. What's cool about these records available under foil is that they have all this information about where you were when you came to America, your exact naturalization date, but even better, something I did know, but many people don't, the exact court where you naturalized. Now, this is a guy named Sam Schwartz. It took me years to find out which Sam Schwartz was my Sam Schwartz and when did he naturalize because it was before 1906, so not a ton of information in the document. But if I had gotten this first, I would know, oh, he had to be an American citizen to vote in 24, so he had to put down where and when exactly he naturalized. Um, it tells me, you know, were you an owner? Where do you live? Are you a first-time voter? And some random stuff I didn't even think would be there, like my great-grandfather worked at a laundry company. Okay. And it referenced his high school graduation from PS76 and gave the date. I didn't know why this was there. A couple other people on the page also had their high school res re uh, graduation listed. I think it's because around 1921, New York State changed their constitution and their laws to basically say, not like a literacy test, but to prove you were okay to vote. You basically had to prove you were educated enough. They were kind of freaked out by all the immigrants coming in and wanting to vote. And they're like, well, we have to prove that they're actually okay to be a, a voter. And so you either register, you either reference your actual graduation from an American high school, or sometimes they would make you go through a test where you wrote down part of what they were dictating from the New York State Constitution. Crazy laws. So I think that's why they listed that. But now I know his high school graduation name and date so I can send a FOIL request to the New York City Department of Education and say, under New York State FOIL, I want a copy of his, of his records. Because at the time I sent it, it was less than 100 years, roughly 100 years, and under the New York City records retention schedule for the Department of Education, which I found in red, it said you're supposed to hold on to those records for 100 years, or sometimes permanently. All these educational records that you might have for your family, where people went to high school or college, uh, high school or uh, even middle school or elementary school, sometimes they're never allowed to throw those student records away. Now, I'm sure they have no database of who is where in what enormous filing cabinet in some warehouse somewhere, but legally they're supposed to have copies. And so I'm going to chase them down to make sure they give me this copy. If they, and if they don't have it, they need to explain why they legally don't have something they're supposed to have. I would love to get an index to everybody say at PS76 from 1916. Why not? This is public data. We should get copies. You see where I'm going with all this. So, and your, your high schools where your family may have gone, you should look into this too. Find records retention schedules for your educational uh, departments. Okay, more ripple effects from that one case in New York City. We didn't need to use like the threat of the law at all to deal with Jersey. New Jersey's law is called the Open Public Records Act, OPRA. O-P-R-A. Um, so we didn't need to send a request at all. We'd actually just got in touch with the executive director and told him what we wanted to do. And he was super nice. His name is Joseph Klett. And he was like, yeah, of course I'll give you the index. You know, that way people will know what we have so we can fulfill orders of the certificates. I'm like, this is great. Unfortunately, they don't have a lot of indexes. So they can't give me more indexes than they actually have. Like starting in 1904 for the birth, it was an alphabetical order by surname by year. So you could go there and look at all the 1904 births, like cranking through the microfilms, but they didn't have an index of that, so they couldn't give it to me. So I took what I could get, 
and I put it all online. And these were the first 20th century vital records from New Jersey, the first 20th century vital records indexes for Jersey. Um, and that was just great. So you can see this can work sometimes just by talking to someone and telling them what you're gonna do. Did it help that I had one lawsuit under my belt? Maybe. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and keep doing more of these cases. 2016 rolls around. I wanna continue getting these New York City license indexes and the rest of them are still at the city clerk's office where you go to get married. So I send a freedom of information law request to the New York City clerk's office, who by the way, didn't have a FOIL contact person listed on their website, they were breaking the law. But yeah, that was the start of many times they broke the law because we sent them a friendly heads up letter trying to make it as easy as possible. Like, hey, I got these other records. I'm gonna continue and get your records. Um, just so you know, heads up, I'm gonna be using this legal reasoning why these indexes should be open. We cited the law, we CC'd them, no response. They didn't respond to the actual request either. They didn't respond to the request for an appeal. They didn't respond to my attorney calling and leaving messages. And at that point, we're like, all right, let's go back to court because they've mishandled this so badly that it actually goes well for us. We do have to take the step of hiring a lawyer, but it worked out so well that we got everything we wanted and we got attorney's fees. So thanks, New York City. I got to fill out a W-2 and New York City paid me. So thank you, you guys, taxpayers, for your city clerk's office being so incompetent that I ended up getting paid and I got the records too. Cool. Um, yeah, we were mocking them on Twitter <laughs> during the whole time. And eventually we filed and we got the boxes sent to our house. Okay, here's what we got in this case. This was the continuation of the index, 1930 to 1995. Now keep in mind, this is a whole separate agency and I guess the agencies don't talk to each other that much. So they didn't know what they were dealing with. We got microfilms through April, 1972. You can only get what they have. They only had microfilms through 72. For some reason, our Queens microfilm cut off in 71. I'm checking to see if that's a mistake or if that's just what they had. But we also had some content that was on uh, a Excel spreadsheet that the city clerk's office had made on their own computers to make it easier for them to look up marriage records. They wouldn't have to go back to the microfilm machines because who wants that? So they had to send me their Excel spreadsheets. So we have two overlapping sets of data. We got microfilms, 1930 to 72, but we got Excel spreadsheets, 1950 to 1995. So you can tell 50 to 72, you have two formats, potentially. It's a good thing that we have both because their Excel spreadsheets have a lot of problems and they're missing some data. They're missing about 30,000 records from 1967. They're missing a lot of the earlier stuff. Their transcription is not up to par with standard genealogy transcriptions. They did all sorts of weird stuff like if the last name was like McCain, they would put a space after the MC. So it became weird to look through. I mean, it was, it's better that we have both versions to compare to. So if you're looking for a New York City marriage license, check both. But because at least some of it was already transcribed, even if it was imperfect, I thought, hey, I can build a website for this because that's what I do. I chose tech instead of choosing law. So I bought the domain name nycmarriageindex.com and I made a website. And you can, on the right in those green buttons, Download the raw data, no restrictions, no copyrights, just download the raw huge Excel spreadsheets if that's what you want. But what you probably wanna do is click the blue button which lets you search for free. Um, and this is all up there, you can do a search. It does sound alike names, it does wildcard searching, all the good stuff. Um, for an example, this um, is the search results. And the number one I have up here is actually Bill de Blasio, married Bill de Blasio, he's listed under his legal name at the time he got married in 1994, Warren de Blasio Wilhelm. So that's why he's there. And on the far right, I added a little code to show you visually, is this a restricted record or is this an open record? Because in New York City, a marriage license is completely open after 50 years to anybody. If it's less than 50 years, it's restricted unless both parties are dead and you can prove it with the, with the death certificates or you're one of the parties or you're their lawyer. So, you know, if you're looking for like my grandparents' marriage license is open, even though one of my grandparents is still alive. And I also uploaded all the images to the Internet Archive and so on. And everybody else has started picking up this data and adding it too. That's what I love. I'm happy to have it on other sites too. Everything we get is free. As long as a copy is also on the Internet Archive, also free, I'm okay with it also being on paid genealogy sites. So my heritage put that data up. German Genealogy Group nonprofit put that up. Uh, New, uh, Ancestry put it up, and they even transcribed a lot of the images that had never been transcribed. 
But there's kind of a problem. There should be Stanford, not Lanford, but that's minor. The bigger issue, which I've talked to them about, is that this is a marriage license date, license place, license number. And they use the words like certificate. They use like marriage date. Well, that's not his marriage date. That's when he applied for the license. He got married a week or two after that. Things like that. And that's still up there. And hopefully they'll fix that soon. Another example is he, he was in both. He was in 1950 marriage. So he showed up in both the transcribed microfilms and the Excel spreadsheet. So when they transcribe, the labels need to be fixed. But when they got it directly from the spreadsheet, the label also still needs to be fixed, but in a different way. So just be a little careful using their new database until they fix that. OK, new stuff I keep getting. I want to expand beyond New York City. I have New York City roots, but this is a bigger issue for all of us in genealogy to get these records. So I start looking at New York State. Why should New York State, meaning not New York City, be such a black hole in terms of no records available? This is a major population center, major port of entry, particularly important if you're doing Jewish genealogy research. How could there be nothing online? How do they not care? Well, here's the thing. They care a little bit. They have an open data portal where you post government spreadsheets to show off how open and newfangled you are, and they do actually post something here. For years, they've been posting the 1957 to present date, so really this should be 66, death index for New York State, and they update this quarterly. It's just the index. It's like a big spreadsheet. Some of the four pay sites incorporate this into their site, but the, some, have, some have not updated since the past three years. So I thought, well, wait a minute. They're, they're finally transcribing and making available a New York State death index for the middle of the 20th century. What about the older records? The reason they're stopping 50 years ago is there's a 50-year restriction on certificates. Now, that's not supposed to mean a 50-year restriction on the index, but I'm letting that slide for the moment. be a bigger fish to fry. So what happens to all the records before 1957? Why isn't there even an index of who's dead? Well, here's the thing. There is an index of who's dead. It's on microfiche not film, microfiche, at a small number of New York State upstate libraries where you can go in, use one fiche at a time, trading it for your driver's license, not allowed to use pencils while you look at the precious microfiche, which are scratched up and hard to use. Like, this is 2017. That's insane. There's no reason a major state should not have a database and have to use microfiche. Those fiches are also available at NARA in uh, National Archives in Manhattan. So I thought, wait a minute. This is the same idea and the same legal underlying legal premise as my New York City um, Municipal Archives case. They've admitted these are public records by making them available to the public at these very small number of locations with very strict hours and rules. But the issue about whether they're open has already been fixed. So I can legally say, you already said these are public records, so now I'm going to get a copy under FOIL. And that's what I did. I filed saying, hi, you have these on microfiche. I would like a copy from 1880 to 1965, which is when they, they pick up with their own, their own index. And I got it. It took me 17 months, but you'll notice the date. And I didn't have to sue them. That's always such a nice thing to say. I did have to bring lawyers into it at one point last year when they attempted to charge us a ridiculous fee, when they attempted to set a 30-day exploding offer, which I then had to have a lawyer tell them, that's not in the law, would you like to try again? Um, so it did cost us a couple hundred dollars to legally deal with their stupidity. One of the reasons it finally went through is their records access officer left and was replaced by somebody sane, and I could deal with the sane person much more easily. That's basically it. It's not that there was ever an underlying legal fight. It's just people not wanting to give up control of public records. So we got it. And they're online now, all of them, forever. They'll never be able to make you just use the microfilm or the microfiche. Um, so they were scanned from the vault copies. And they're pretty good. So this is what some of the older ones look like. And you see they have the town name too, or the county name sometimes. And this is what the newer ones look like. Let me go back. So that you can tell at some point they had a database and they printed it out on this dot matrix printer and they microfiched the dot matrix printouts and then we scanned the microfiche and now they're on the internet. So it's like five generations removed. 1943, by the way, is a hot mess. It's so hard to read. There was something wrong with their film in their own vault, which should tell you something about why it was so crucial to get these online. I hope we'll find a better copy someday. So this is all getting transcribed. There are transcription projects out there now and many more starting soon. This will be a text searchable database on all your favorite websites before you know it.
I'm not getting so involved with transcription. I know there are other groups out there who will do it. The Italian genealogy group, the German genealogy group, Family Search, and all the, uh, the for-profit companies too. They're all going to transcribe, especially something from a state. So I don't need to worry and I don't want to get involved. I just want to put it out there. So feel free to download these. Uh, that's still excluding New York City. However, there are some New York City deaths in there, just coincidentally, especially in the earlier years where, say, Flushing was not incorporated into New York City yet, so it shows up there. People who may have been from New York City but died in upstate or vice versa. And sometimes there's a little bit of overlap, even though there's not supposed to be. Um, one more thing is these records don't include Buffalo, Albany, or Yonkers through 1915 for some reason. Those were, they didn't want to get with the program and do like statewide registration of death until later. So I'm going to have to go back and get those three cities um, uh, to basically give me their records too. I'll say like, hi, I got the state ones. Can you give me your missing records now too? So we have really a complete set. That'll be later this year. All right, I'm running out of time a little, so I'm going to go a little faster. I'm going to be around. You can ask me as many questions as you want a little later. My, I have a pending case right now in Missouri. Missouri tried to charge me $1.5 million for their birth index and death index. I said no. Um, I got an attorney involved. Then they dropped the, the charge to, oh, we actually think it'll be $5,000, our bad. And then we said, okay, well, actually, it should be a little less. And then they said, you know what? We're just not going to give it to you because... It's a long story. I can go into this more later if you'd like to hear. We're asking just for the index. We're not going after their certificates. We're not trying to violate people's privacy. This is the birth index from 1910 to, the, to 2016, um, actually to 2015, and the death index 1966 to 2015. It's just the index. It's a surname, a given name, and a date. And the only reason we're asking is it explicitly says in the Missouri Vital Records Laws, which we cited to them in our Missouri Sunshine Law requests, it says that you can request any person in Missouri's birth date or death date, or rather everyone born or who died on a certain date. Um, while most records obviously are sealed, you can still request a specific date. So I thought, oh, what if I just request every date? And I did. So this case I can talk about more after this presentation is over. If you want to hear the details, it's still in progress. We filed the day before Thanksgiving. Um, but meanwhile, it's won two awards in the last year or so. The first award was the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, awarded it one of the, out, the outrageous fee award as part of the FOILES, which is the annual roundup of the best freedom of information stories of the year. This was the outrageous fee award. This is one of about 14 or 15 awards they gave out about how crazy it was to try to charge $1.5 million for a database file. Um, other winners of this award that year were Trump and Sheriff Clark. So good job, Missouri. Also, I was a fine, or this case was a finalist very recently in the 2017 Golden Padlock Awards. These are given out by the Investigative Reporters and Editors Group, IRE, IR. It's for the worst abuses of the freedom of information laws in the state. That's the way they phrase it. Where it's not just they rejected something and they were, had no reason, but that they had used advanced trickery or treachery or deception or things like that. So I was one of five to get Missouri up there um, we didn't win. We lost to the new head of the EPA. So there's always next year. <laughs> so we sued. <laughs> so that, that's ongoing. Technically, Missouri wins. Whoever is the worst wins. But I was the one who brought it to their attention. And I think that's really interesting because genealogy, this is the first time a fight for genealogical records access was known by a large reporter and editor group, investigative reporters, who were looking at how badly we're all being treated with respect to records access. Like We're all kind of used to this, that, oh, gee, I wish I could have that index, but that state just doesn't allow it. But when you put it up there and you format it correctly and you show it to reporters and editors, they're like, that's insane. Um, so I think that should tell you about how much there needs to be activism in this world and not just nostalgia and going along and begging and hoping things will change. Hoping didn't get us anywhere. Fighting did. Fighting is what's going to fix this. So this is where I wrap up and tell you about Reclaim the Records and why we want to do more of this for more states and more cities. This is our website, although actually it's about to have its front page changed very, very soon. Reclaimtherecords.org. And we are a website. We're a virtual genealogical group. We have that, that email list you can sign up for. We have Twitter. We have Facebook. We're very active on social media. We want more records. We want there to be more out there. I want to tell you about new things for the towns and cities you're interested in. 
But to keep doing this, and I really want to keep doing this because this is fun and this is helpful and this is getting us somewhere, I need help. And so that is why, after two years of doing this on my own, I incorporated as a 501c3 this year. And we are just starting to open up and ask for help. And by help, I mean the D word, donations. I am hopeful, and I am hopeful that some of you might think this is a worthy project to keep fighting, because once we fight, we get it online forever, not behind a paywall, not with a deal with a for-profit company, forever free. And this is what I want to keep doing. So use our website. You can take our record survey. Tell us about what you know should be available and isn't. We have a to-do list with something like 69 items on it that we vetted everyone before we put them online. You can see what we're going to do next. This is some of our short-term list for New York State. Um, you can see we want to sort of be completist, so we want to go from a black hole to something that is much more covered. Just check off all the boxes. Um, we also want to get the domestic partnership registry, both for New York City and New York State, because no one's ever gotten that before, and I think those should be included. If we're going to go after marriage records, we need to go after those records too. Those people deserve to be in our databases too. New York City. We have a long list of stuff. And again, many of these, these are the easy stuff. This is why this is on the short-term list. I know this is like, whoa, that's a lot of stuff, but these are all agencies we already dealt with. Once you crack that dam, you can get everything out of there. Maybe not the actual certificate, because they are allowed to charge a price, but other things. And I want to get them all online. There is no reason there should be a single copy in New York City and not in any other location. That is sad. That is, that's a warehouse. That's not an archive. Here is what I really want to do, talking big-term goals, big long-term goals. I never went after the New York City Department of Health, New York City, not state, Department of Health, because I didn't need to. I figured, well, they have a birth index and death index in these books that are at the library, and through 1965, they're on microfilms. So I don't really need to like, go after them because that's already there. I want to go after things that are not there. But one day, they weren't there anymore. One day, a couple months ago, the New York City Department of Health went to the New York Public Library, a public library on 42nd Street, and took these books off the shelf in the middle of the night. They're all gone. Those are public records they retroactively classified. That is not a road we want to start going down. I want those records back. You can't legally do that. I've had two conversations with the Committee on Open Government. They're livid. How dare you take these books away from the public? If you don't want to publish them anymore, that's one thing. But you're going to take them from the public? I don't think so. You can't retroactively have, oops, backseas, we're going to take them back now. That's my sister's name in that book, which I happened to photograph that day, Nicole Haley Schreier. You can see she's listed there twice, once as female Schreier, with matching certificate numbers, because they gave her female Schreier before my parents figured out what to name her, and then they fixed it later. There are a number of reasons why they may have taken these books. One of them involves reusing certificate numbers when they reissue certificates. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that afterwards, but whatever the reasoning was, it was a dumb reason. So I want those back. And that is going to be a fight, because the New York City Department of Health is a pain to deal with. Yeah, no, I have had people in the front, law, front row seeing, saying words I can't say on the live stream. <laughs> New York City Department of Health is terrible to deal with, and this was wrong to take these books. There is no reason. And I want these back, and I don't want the books, because it's 2017. I want the database, and I want them online forever. I want my records back. And I hope you'll help me with this because this will be a suit. This probably won't get settled. I know what they're like. And a lawsuit that doesn't settle is expensive, and we are now a 501c3, and we have tax-deductible donations, and we hope you all want this back too. This is something we're going to have to take a little while to get right, but we're going to make it right. We need your help. I hope you'll help us. I've never asked for donations before. I've never done anything like this. But this is a community effort at this point. We have a tool that can finally get these records back. We need to use it. If we don't use it, then these records are going to be locked away forever. So I hope you understand that this is, more, this is about more than just genealogical records. This is records access. This is access to our public records and the government belonging to the people. So please, go to our website. We have a little donate button in the top right corner. I added it last night for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one more slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to say we need to get these because no one else is going to be getting these. They're, all these other organizations and agencies, they're not going to stick their necks on the line to fight the government. They'll be happy to repost my images or my data, but they are not going to want to make enemies. 
I don't care if I make enemies because I want these records. The records fairy is not going to come in in the middle of the night and give you the records you want. If you want them, you have to get them. So that's why we need to do this. So be your own records fairy, okay? File freedom of information requests for your own records, for your own family, for your own town and city. And we should use these laws because we're lucky we have them. Most of these state laws were implemented right after Watergate because of Watergate, or they were strengthened at that time. Some were much older. They are there because we need to have governments responsible to the people. And that is another reason why it is so important that we all take responsibility for our own records and our own work. So God bless America and thank you. Okay, questions? Yes. Um, you mentioned New York City educational records. What kind of records are there? Are there oh, that's transcripts? A, that's a really good record. That's a really good question. Okay, as far as I know from reading the, um, the records retention schedule, there's two kinds of records stored by New York City that should still be available. One are the permanent record, like this will go down on your permanent record. There really was a permanent record for every student, and it includes grades, IQ tests, um, attendance records, schools, everything like that. I did, cry, I did try asking for my great-grandmother's record, but because I didn't know what school she went to and I didn't know her exact graduation date, they told me, I'm sorry, we can't look for it. We don't have an index that far back. It would have been around 1916 also. But in the case of my great-grandfather, I know the school, I know the exact date, so I'm still trying with that one. The other kind of New York City education record that should exist is there were school censuses done starting around 1949 in all school census, so the school itself had records attached to it. Now, if those people are still living, you can't get them under a law called FERPA, which protects privacy rights, but there should be some parts of this that are available, especially if your relative is dead. I would love to see my grandfather's like high school transcripts. Why not? But my 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 high school says they can't find my transcript. They're supposed. Are you in New York City? New York City. Wow. And Famous there's... school, Ramaz. I know. <laughs> Wait, Ramaz is not a public school though. It's only public school records. It's only public. Uh, yeah, that's okay. the, that's the thing about these laws. You can't really use them for a private cemetery, private school, Thank private you. organization. It's really government records. Uh, sorry, you do you mind lining up at the at the at the microphone? Yes. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. I've been downtown New York and, and gone through the whole microfilm and, and making copies, and it's such an arduous thing to do. Oh. They actually sent you the entire original microfilms? Yeah. It's Brand new. Copy from the vaults. So it was a copy? Or did they, I mean, did they just take them away from the public and no, they, the originals? When or they, when they had microfilms, they made two copies. One went into circulation at the municipal archives or wherever, but one was stored in a vault. Oh, so that's what they, and that's what they, they used the vaults to make the copies, so my copies are better than the ones that have been Absolutely. in circulation all these yeah, the years. Yeah, the ones that are there are, are, get used very, very much. Yes, they do. And this is yep. much easier to sit at home oh, in your pajamas and use. Fantastic. So. Thank you so much. No problem. Hello. Hello, Brooke. <laughs> I believe you said that you thought Pennsylvania was the only state that had indices that were uh, embargoed. Where the index was actually okay. written to the, the state Bottle law. The Vital Records Act, which has been adopted in some states, treats indices the same as records. Uh. So there are embargo dates in Oregon and Oklahoma, but Oklahoma recently changed, yes. and so the embargo dates for death records are only five years and birth for 20, but if you go to Oregon, it is the same as death records. Oh. And they are in the proposed regulations in Maine that have been sitting there for five years, and I keep telling them since they didn't adopt the law, they shouldn't include that in the regulations, that it's just sitting there. Right. So we all have to be vigilant in our states yes. and keep the eyes open so that we can do, make sure that indices are not treated as records yes. and so that the Freedom of Information Act will be able, uh, Freedom of Information Law in the state is not going to be uh, exempt uh, that you can't use it. You want to be able to use exactly. it. Exactly. And I want to say Jan has done amazing work in this regard, especially with RPAC. She should really be commended for the work you guys have done. Jan was somebody who wrote letters, I believe it was in Massachusetts in this past year. They tried to not make their, Vermont, that was it, Vermont? Right, because of her work, we got Vermont to make sure that their index would still be available even if there were differences in how they were storing the certificates. We made sure the index should always be available. The index is not the same as the certificate. It's a finding aid. It's not revealing too much. So thank you for all your work. Yes. Hi, thank you for your work. Um, I was able to get from New York City the death certificate for my grandmother, but they will not give me the cause of death, which I tried to get. And I cannot. Do you know what the law is? I don't that? know the specific laws in New York City. I know at some point they started redacting it, but it should be open after a certain number of years. No? Um, I, 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 I
Oh, yes. It, it started getting redacted when because HIV of HIV. became a political issue, they removed the cause of death. There is no time limit for them to then allow it to come back on. Uh, well, I'm hoping there's something we can do Even in the future. Even though it's 1957 death. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. That, during the 1980s, during the 1980s and 1990s, some funeral homes and mortuaries and cemeteries refused to take people who had died of HIV or AIDS, and it was uh, discrimination. And rather than fight the discrimination, they just removed it from all the death certificates, which removed information from the public. And they never had a sunset term on the law. I'm from Illinois, and um, we have a situation where there, there are some abuses by cemeteries back a number of years ago, and now the state is requiring all the cemeteries to report all the deaths or burials, I guess to them, and I called him up and he said, well, I said, could I get copies of all yeah. that? And he said, that's not available to the public. But I assume that he was pushing me off and I don't, I'm not, I wasn't really familiar with what exactly I could do under the Freedom of Information. That would be an interesting one to research because if they're reporting it and it's just the index because it's just the names, it's not the actual certificates. And yeah, I, I don't believe think it's in the death it, certificates. I think it's just the- Like the index to who was buried there. So that's not the certificate which is you know, prohibited, but it's the actual just finding aid. That might be something to look into. Okay. Talk to me later. <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. Hello. Hi. Can you comment on uh, what I think was the New York City Death Index? I was looking at it real briefly. Yes. And it looks like uh, within one letter of the alphabet, there are groups that are out of order. I'm not sure what you're speaking to. Are you talking about the New York City Marriage License Index? I think, I think it was the Death Index, because uh, I was looking for somebody in particular well, I don't have death. the New York City death index yet. Or I have the New York State's death index. State, okay. What whatever it was, and I was you know busy and not. I don't know, but it. I can I can help you with it. I okay. They we only get whatever they have, and yeah. what they have is imperfect. They actually missed some of those printout pages when they did their own microfiche version. So I can only get what they have. And okay. Israel, I yes. Did some yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to just emphasize, though, if you have any suggestions for new content to get, those are all things we want to delve into. For other areas of the country, Missouri was my first time going out of the Northeast. And I want to keep doing other sections, too. But I need to know what is out there that really has not been made available yet. I don't have a full handle on all 50 states. No one does. But maybe you know about something. Or it could be a local issue where there's just some local record set that really should be available just to flip through, but the librarian is only keeping it behind their desk and they're only the one who will look up things in the index. I hear stories like that. They won't let you look at the wills or something. There's all these issues. And the more we push back, the more we become a force and it's a snowball that rolls and we start to finally get somewhere. We have a lot of nostalgia and family love and family history here. We need a little more activism. And that's what I hope you'll come with me to do. Thank you.